A Russian man claiming to hold top-level secrets about Russian advanced bombers has just turned up at the U.S. southern border, seeking asylum. The man claims to have been an engineer at a production facility over in the city of Kazan, and he says that he possesses top-secret information about the White Swan Tu-160, which is the most advanced bomber in the Russian arsenal. U.S. border officials, they interviewed the man, and they determined that his story was in fact credible and eventually passed him off to the FBI, who are still in the process of interrogating him right now. However, analysts have pointed out that the fact that this story was even leaked to the public is an indication that perhaps the American government is encouraging other Russians who also hold top-level secrets to also escape to America. And if you thought that was interesting, well then you should click on that button below this video and check out Epic TV, one of the best no-censorship video platforms on the internet. Welcome to this event at Hudson Institute. Hudson Institute is a research organization promoting American leadership for a secure, free, prosperous America for ourselves, for our allies. Thank you so much for joining us today for this important discussion. My name is Rebecca Heinrichs. I'm a senior fellow here at Hudson. I specialize in um, studying uh, national defense policy, in particular strategic deterrence. I also lead our Keystone Defense Initiative. And so I'm, I'm thrilled to have our current guest with us here today, General Boussier. I, I'm, I'm going to give you just a. I'm going to give just a little brief introduction. I'm not going to go over all these wonderful things that you've done, um, but 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 if, uh, you all should know who he is. He is the Air Force Global Strike Command commander, and he. I, I how I think about what he does. He's the sort of the pointy end of deterrence, and so I'll let him explain kind of what he does um, in relation to U.S. Strategic Command, and then sort of like the fun stuff that he did. I'm sure what he does right now is really fun, but he also is a pilot. He's a command pilot with more than 3,400 hours in the T-38 Talon, the F-15C Eagle, the B-28 Spirit, the Lancer, the Raptor. Thank you so much. That must have been a lot of, that was a lot of fun. Um, but you've promoted and you're doing wonderful and great things now. Um, what we're here to talk about today, though, is your current role as the commander of Air Force uh, Global Strike Command. So if you could just start us off, sir, talking about your responsibilities in your command and how you fit um, and work and support for U.S. Strategic Command. Thank, thanks, Rebecca. Before I do that, if you don't mind, I would like to uh, acknowledge and thank the uh, airmen that are out in the field right now, standing in the watch in our ICBM uh, mission or flying around the world in our bomber mission. I don't think we need to forget that that's been going on for decades, and we, it's a very, very silent service that maintains the foundational defense of our nation. So I'd like to start with that and thank them and their families for what they do every day. Um, been back to Global Strike Command for about five months. Uh, Air Force Global Strike Command stood up 14 years ago this August uh, as the, uh, the stewards of the nation's ICBM and bomber legs that support General Cotton at U.S. STRATCOM. Uh, this command was stood up very purposefully in 2009, uh, and it's an absolute privilege to be part of a team that has that responsibility to provide uh, day in and day out uh, our nation's bedrock defense with the uh, ICBM force and the bomber force. So uh, Air Force Global Strike Command is designated as the air component at U.S. STRATCOM. Um, we have about 32,000 folks that support that mission across the fabric of our nation. Um, we support General Cotton in his uh, mission space for strategic deterrence, nuclear operations, um, nuclear command and control and communications, and global strike. Uh, and we do that with the forces that have been assigned. That's great. Now, one thing, you, you have articulated this, this point in the past really well, and this was something that the, the prior um, commander of U.S. Strategic Command has said, too, and so I think it's important. I want you to kind of explain it for us. You've said that it's an assured aspect of every regional commander's operational plans that strategic deterrence, and within that, nuclear deterrence will hold. What do you mean by that? So, so that's a nuance that 
is kind of understood as an underpinning of every uh, geographic combatant commander's operational plans. Uh, so they build their plans for their regional uh, operations. Um, and within those plans is an underlying assumption that strategic deterrence and within that nuclear deterrence will hold. I would offer to you, and you can kind of walk through different scenarios, uh, that if someone uses a nuclear weapon in a regional uh, conflict, it kind of unravels um, the operation, and it basically unhinges what we have enjoyed for 70 plus years in, in the strategic stability. Um, I would offer to you that you could probably think through uh, a nation uh, having a capability uh, of uh, a nuclear weapon in a nation that doesn't, and what that would do um, for that regional stability. That's very well said. And I think it's really important because the mission of U.S. Strategic Command and then your command, I think sometimes people uh, misunderstand it as something separate and apart from the everyday operations that what we do, what the United States does in the world, but it really it, it underpins it and it supports these regional combat commanders. Absolutely. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the challenging threat environment where we're, we're, we're now in and, and, and the, where you are now um, taking over this command. Um, a lot of things have changed since the Cold War. We don't just have one major nuclear power to contend with. Um, talk to us about, about the threat environment. So I, I, I uh, explain the, uh, the current world environment uh, in the context of my career. So I've, uh, I'm close now, 37 years of uh, service and I offer to you that the international environment is more complicated now than it's ever been since I've been in the Air Force. Um, uh, for those of you that have either uh, read or, or uh, are familiar with uh, the aspects of the Cold War followed by the um, uh, conflicts in the Middle East with the violent extremists, um, we are now facing uh, two uh, nuclear peer adversaries that have the capability uh, to hold at risk um, almost anything in any domain at the time and place of their choosing. Uh, that's a very unique uh, aspect that our nation has not uh, faced in many, many decades. Um, and it's an it's a, uh, underpinning of how we deal with that um, within the realm of the strategic deterrence forces. Um, and uh, it only uh, reinforces the need to recapitalize and modernize uh, based on what we're seeing. So let's talk about that. So our, our, um, our, our current plans, our acquisition strategy for our nuclear deterrent force, our triad, was really conceived of in a different threat environment. The budget for it, the plans for it um, was conceived in, it depends on who you ask, when the, when the program of record really started, but 2008, 2009. Talk to us about does it, you know, what's the importance of sticking with it? Does it need to change or adapt? Um, how satisfied with you with the direction we are, we're headed on? So for, for many, many reasons, the nation had made decisions over the last few decades to defer modernization, recapitalization. So what we're witnessing now is the recapitalization and modernization of all three legs of the triad. Um, I think we're at, um, I think we're at 14 uh, concurrent administrations that have come in and validated the need for a triad. Um, and uh, we are at the back end of our operational margin with our current fleet. Um, but to your point, the current recapitalization efforts in all three legs were planned really against the 2010 threat mm -hmm. environment. So uh, it only, in my opinion, it only makes uh, our efforts to recapitalize that more important. Um, and I think our nation, and I think most uh, uh, most folks will, would realize that it would be a prudent step to evaluate as we go through the next decade our current force posture, as Congress has asked uh, 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 various different members to look at our strategic posture. And, and just to put a finer point on that, when we think about the 2010 threat environment, really we were just talking about Russia as the major nuclear peer. Um, and then we had the rogue state, North Korea, as a lesser uh, problem challenge that we had to continue to deter. 
violent extremism. And we really weren't thinking about, well, people were thinking about it, but we didn't, weren't planning against China as a peer threat. And that's the big thing Correct. that has changed. Um, well, let's stick with, with Russia also, because e even the nature of the Russia challenge has changed. It's not just that there's now two peers coming um, and, the, and the trajectory that China's on is very concerning in terms of their nuclear weapons growth. Um, but the arms control environment is, is, is much different. Um, Russia has suspended compliance with the New START Treaty. You've, you've discussed that previously in, in public about how that continues to also present a challenge. Yeah, so I, I have a little bit of experience with, um, uh, had the opportunity to be part of uh, the arms control team uh, negotiating uh, with the Russians as it relates to the follow on to New START. Um, and to your point, when New START was um, formed, the world was a different place. Um, so even uh, without the current suspension uh, with the Russian uh, uh, president's uh, decision to suspend participation in New START, um, we had decades of strategic stability mechanisms with the Soviet Union and then Russia. Uh, strategic stability talks, we had different uh, treaty mechanisms, um, even though New START necessarily didn't account for all of Russia's weapons, uh, it provided a stability uh, uh, in the international order with that treaty. We have no such thing with China. Uh, so as our nation approaches the expiration of New START, um, if asked, I'd recommend uh, that we would look at uh, an international treaty that uh, captures all the potential um, threats that we would face. And, and, and you mentioned uh, uh, the good point about how it's not, not even just formal treaties, but other kinds of stability measures would, would be an improvement, especially with our relationship with the Chinese who, who from my understanding, still aren't picking up the phone when we want them to, um, in particular, uh, challenges. Yeah, I, I look at uh, the, the, um, the different mechanisms you have available for providing stability. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of them, which is part of my uh, business, is providing a credible uh, deterrent. Uh, the other piece, in my opinion, would be a, a stable, verifiable treaty regimen. And then obviously, uh, the capability to uh, have a uh, robust non-proliferation uh, protocols. So those three together, I think, would be a healthy mix. Um, and they all, they all help support each other. Yeah, they're complementary. They shouldn't be in, in, in conflict, um, but the deterrence piece obviously needs to hold. It's the underpinning for our ability. Really well said. Um, talk about bombers. I had the pleasure of attending the B-21 unveiling uh, out in California, great, great airplane. airplane. Um, and there's a lot of hope and expectation that this, this new airplane is gonna provide. Uh, it's next gen for our bomber fleet. Can you talk to us about how we're thinking about the B-21 and anything else you want to add in terms of just general bomber fleet in the mix? So uh, um, we are on a uh, pretty um, steep path to re, uh, reinvigorate the bomber leg. Um, so as it relates to the B-21, obviously a very highly technically advanced uh, penetrating uh, weapon system. Um, really designed with an open architecture, which provides you the capability of upgrading that weapon system over time as new technologies uh, come in play. Um, and, uh, and right now we are buying at least 100, which will provide the, the foundational element of our bomber fleet as we build out the, uh, the B-21 fleet and then upgrade the B-52. Mm -hmm. um, you know, April 15th, was the 75th anniversary of the first flight of the B-52. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's pretty astounding to think that we're going to be flying that airplane for another 30 plus years. Uh, new motors, new radar, new avionics. Uh, and uh, the intent would be to have a, a fleet of B-52Js and B-21s. Talk, just a lot of this audience knows this. But I think this is so important, especially with your role. What, why, is, why is the bomber leg so important? Why, why, why is that? You mentioned the point that, there, that 
administration, regardless of who's been in office, Republican and Democrat, they've all supported the triad. And some, you know, some don't take a hard look at it when they come into office and say, do we still need this? And they come back each time and they've maintained that continuity, said this is the best way for us to conduct credible deterrence. What does the bomber leg provide us? And, in the, and specifically in this environment, why is it so important? So all, all three legs of the triad over the last, you know, 60 plus years, the nation has realized and as the, this capability was developed post-World War II, um, the complementary aspects and characteristics of the land leg, the sea leg, or the air leg. Um, obviously, the land leg uh, is the most responsive and stabilizing force uh, because it is um, for someone to attack that would be an attack on the United States, which uh, in of itself is part of the deterrence factor uh, within the triad. Um, the sea leg is characterized as the ability to survive because it's out in the seas. And then the bomber leg is, is dual docked, right? So it has both a conventional capability as well as a nuclear capability. Uh, but the bomber leg provides flexible, recallable, um, in this case, standoff as well as penetrating capabilities. Um, and it's a, it's a phenomenal uh, tool for the national command authorities to signal to allies uh, and potential adversaries uh, the capabilities the United States uh, has to hold it there. So uh, th that's a really important point, too. It's that, that the ability to do nuclear signaling that, um, that provides the assurance to our allies who we have committee treat, you know, commitments to, treaty commitments to, for their security, um, to, to, to prevent that, that other point that you made, uh, which is proliferation. You want to maintain assurance, make sure our allies are, feel secure, especially in this environment, which you have the Russians engaging in nuclear brinksmanship as they continue their unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. And then you have the China challenge. And so that provides that, that assurance. Yeah, I don't think you have to go too far back in, uh, in public reporting in the last few months to see that we've had uh, bomber task force missions into Europe, into the Pacific region, whether it's uh, in Spain, uh, India, or in uh, um, various different uh, allies and partners in the Indian Pacific region. Uh, that provides a great mechanism to show the American flag. It provides a great mechanism to reassure our allies. Uh, and it's just a reminder to any potential adversary that we have the capability of going anywhere. So are you confident then, are you, are you you're pretty confident if you could have, you know, if you could ask for more, to, are, you, are you comfortable with the number of bombers, bomber fleet plan currently? Um, understanding that if we continue to evaluate, to your point, the threat environment, can make some changes there. And then my second question goes with that then, what about the weapons then that go on, go on the bombers? So uh, right now the plan for the B-21 is at least 100. Um, with the modified B-52, which will be designated the B-52J, mm -hmm. uh, we'll have 176 um, uh, bombers in the current plan. Uh, the Air Force is on record saying we need 220. Um, and I, I think the, the Secretary is um, very cognizant of the fact that as the years go on, we have to make an evaluation of what the right uh, mix of airframes are uh, in the United States Air Force to meet our national security needs. Um, so very comfortable with where we are with the bombers right now in the, in the roadmap. Um, for the weapons, we have a, a mix of both uh, conventional and nuclear uh, weapons that are being developed. The, the LRSO is obviously the replacement for uh, the uh, Alcom. Um, that weapon is uh, well past its service life. Uh, again, just one more example where the nation post-Cold War ending made decisions to defer uh, recapitalization based on what the world was presenting at the time. Uh, the world's a very different place right now, and uh, so we are not only recapitalizing uh, our weapon systems, we're recapitalizing our weapons, uh, and we're, uh, we're giving our airmen the tools to do the job we're asking them to do. Um, you know, and, and you know this, I'd just like to highlight that we, we talk a lot about airplanes. We talk a lot about weapon systems. Um, but, but ultimately, those are just the tools of the trade to be able to provide our airmen, uh, uh, which are the most valuable weapon system, uh, what they need to do the job we've asked them to do, which they volunteered to do. Mm -hmm. That's an important aspect we can't lose sight of. Our most valuable weapon system is the airman. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, and then um, you, so you talk about the numbers, you're comfortable with the numbers, kind of the current plan, and, and, and the weapon systems. And you've mentioned now a couple of times that, you know, it was a different threat envi environment, which we had this plan. So there are certain things that we're a little bit maybe behind on, recapitalization that we want to we really want to go at the speed of relevance, I think is the term uh, the Pentagon likes to use. Do they still use that? Yes. Okay, sorry. Um, but we want to go fast to give the warfighters what they need to do their job. But um, we should, I think, sometimes take stock of, give ourselves some credit. We did build in a hedge for a potential threat environment deterioration. So it may not have been, you know, we couldn't have or we didn't plan for the China-Russia um, potential simultaneous problem, opportunistic problem that we might have with these two powers, especially as they converge and continue to cooperate in a concerning fashion. So we, we didn't anticipate that, but we did build ourselves ahead. And so our, 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 how are we thinking about that now? How are we setting ourselves up? Especially, I want to stick with just bombers, then we'll move on to, to Sentinel. But open architecture, things like that, where we're trying to give ourselves an opportunity to make changes in the future if we need to. That's different than, because we have new technologies and new things that we're adding. I think, I, well, I have a couple points to make on that uh, kind of topic. So I think, in hindsight, we, we would all agree that um, waiting to recapitalize all three legs of the triad and NC3 at the same time would probably be, if we had the opportunity again, we might want to start that more sequenced, uh, um, both from a technology and industrial uh, capacity, et cetera. Um, but we are where we are. Mm -hmm. um, from a hedge perspective, I mean, there's there's all kinds of aspects to that, right? Uh, so there's, there's a numbers hedge, mm -hmm. there's a technology hedge, um, and I think where we are today, whether it's Sentinel uh, B-21, um, our NC-3 architectures, our new weapon systems, we're building in open architecture so that we can take advantage of the technology as it's presented um, versus the way we built things in the 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, and I, whether that's digital uh, engineering, whether that's digital design, whether that's OMS uh, architecture, um, what we're des designing and developing now is light years ahead of where we were back in the 70s and 80s. So you mentioned then uh, Sentinel, so let's talk about Sentinel. How, how is it going? And then my, the, the second question that kind of pairs with that is since you mentioned industrial base, just kind of touched on that, that is the challenge for the entire, really nation, yeah, I mean it's the, the Pentagon, but our industrial base. So how is the industrial base affecting I mean, your area, uh, the, these two legs of the triad. So, so Sentinel and yeah, so, base. You know, if you look at everything that we're doing, uh, just in the, in the triad portfolio uh, and the workforce available to do that, um, it's a stress environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, so our industry partners that are, are doing this work are really competing for a lot of the same workforce uh, and it's presenting challenges. Um, you know, it was only complicated more by COVID uh, and some of the limitations uh, in the industry as that few years happened. Um, from a from a Sentinel perspective, um, it has been reported to be the largest work project our nation has undertaken in 50 plus years. Um, and uh, if you think about the size and scope of it from a from a landscape across the U.S. or a construction perspective. It is a massive undertaking. Mm -hmm. um, uh, now, I'll tell you the difference between the fielding of the Minuteman III uh, many, many decades ago to where we are in developing the Sentinel. It's, it's uh, again, from a digital perspective or a design perspective, it's light years ahead in how it's being designed and be fielded as a weapon system versus we didn't really design the Minuteman III and field that as a full weapon system. Had different pieces and parts that made up the capabilities that we have in the field today. So that's one big difference of it. Um, uh, the other aspect that I think is important that we don't talk about enough is unlike other uh, capabilities in the department where you sunset and then build on or bring on a new capability, for, the, for our nuclear capabilities, they have to maintain full operational capability while you field a new uh, weapon system. Right. Um, we don't have the luxury of uh, telling the president we're not going to be available for a couple years while 
the field and the capability. So that's a very unique uh, characteristic of our business is we have to maintain full operational capability while we field in those systems. So as we field the B-21, as we field uh, uh, the P-53J, as we field the Sentinel, as we field the uh, Gray Wolf, uh, the new helicopter, we have to maintain our current legacy systems at a full operational capability while we do that. That presents a whole new, another unique challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a manpower challenge. It's a uh, sequence of scheduling uh, challenge. Um, I'm happy with the way uh, the program office and industry are approaching Sentinel. Um, don't, don't, don't be mistaken, there'll be challenges. Every acquisition program has challenges. Um, but what I am confident is because the level of oversight in the department, uh, in Congress, uh, in the Air Force, um, there's a lot of senior members paying attention to this because they know the importance of it. Uh, so uh, um, I am cautiously optimistic uh, that this program uh, will meet the operational needs that we dictated. So uh, you, you also mentioned then, so we've gotten some of these weapon systems, but you've touched on command and control. Talk about that modernization effort. Uh, so we are in the beginning steps of that. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, as we field uh, the new weapon systems in the triad, whether it's the Columbia class, the B-21, the B-53J, the Sentinel weapon system, uh, the underpinning of our nuclear deterrence is the capability to command and control it. That provides the underpinning of our credibility. Um, and we have multiple systems that are decades old that need to be updated and uh, fielded. Same comment. As we field new capabilities to do a nuclear command and control communications, we have to maintain, maintain full operational capability of those legacy systems for the same reasons. Um, so we are in the beginning steps of that. Uh, as you know, uh, the department directed uh, the commander of STRATCOM uh, to stand up the MQ-3 Enterprise Center. Mm -hmm. uh, so the services, the Air Force and the Navy are working uh, with the MQ-3 Enterprise Center in Omaha uh, as we build out the vision and the design for the next generation of MQ-3 um, as we um, maintain our current capabilities and systems today. The big platform that we're uh, responsible for that I think most folks are familiar with is the National Airborne Operations Center, which is the uh, 747-200, the E-4B. Um, and we, we have a program of record uh, um, for the SAOC, uh, the Survival Airborne Operations Center. Process of going through uh, for um, proposal. Great. So, you know, I, I, I like I like to ask. You know, when people talk about we've got the workforce challenge, COVID was challenging. We're recapitalizing all three legs of the triad at the same time. We don't really have margin because we've got a more complicated threat environment, and yet we still have to prioritize. We still have to say that because if everything's a priority, nothing's a priority. So how do you rack and stack your priorities whenever you go and you advocate for your what you need for your command? So I'm uh, somewhat lucky in the sense that our nation, our department, and our Air Force has articulated that this is our nation's number one mission. Mm -hmm. uh, it underpins our nation's defense. It underpins our relationship with our allies and partners. Um, so even though it's, it's a stressed, uh, it, it seems like it's always a stressed fiscal environment. Um, I think our nation understands that we don't have a whole lot of options other than to recapitalize. Um, and uh, the decision to defer over many decades has resulted in uh, what we articulate as a lack of operational margin. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a matter of uh, if we uh, can do it, it's because we have to do it. Right. Right. It's the whole mission. Right. You don't really have anything that you can say isn't as important as the other for right. what you're doing in particular. Well, um, we do have a few minutes before we have a hard stop. So if anybody has any, just a brief, clear question, um, state your name, and then, and then. Hi, I'm uh, Michael Morrow with Breaking Defense. Uh, I wanted to ask specifically. So I wanted to ask uh, specifically on the Sentinel. Uh, you said you're cautiously optimistic. Obviously, there's been a lot of reporting about potential delays. The program as high as two years, as Secretary Kendall said recently. 
that it would be a challenge uh, to meet that schedule. So could you just talk a little bit more about the possible delays that the program is facing, how likely uh, those delays might be? Yeah. So again, I don't want to critique the way we do business in the department, but we're three years into a seven year uh, uh, engineering uh, design phase. Um, and like there are, this is a massive program. Uh, so um, where we are right now is uh, there, there will be delays in different parts of the program, uh, but the department has put a lot of focus on making sure we meet the operational needs of ILC. Um, so again, uh, we will see how the years play out, uh, but again, I'm, I'm optimistic because of the level of oversight and interest in the program. Mm -hmm. That provides me comfort. Okay, we'll take Liz, the last one over here, and then we'll let you, any closing parting thoughts? After this. Thank you. I'm, I'm Sam Nishihata from Happy Science. Uh, could you give us the update of uh, hypersonic weapons programs, um, especially uh, China and Russia, and even North Korea has been boasting the, the, the position of hypersonic weapons. And I wonder how beneficial to have hypersonic weapons and what is the update uh, of the program, current program? Thank you. And let me kind of, maybe if I, if I may, kind of couch it another way too. You mentioned, I thought this was a really important point, back to our original remarks where you said strategic deterrence has to hold, and in particular nuclear deterrence. In other words, those are two slightly different things. So you can talk about strategic deterrence in general and kind of what other weapon systems might be included in that. Yeah, so I, um, as you alluded to, the, there are various different nations developing hypersonic capabilities. Um, uh, our Air Force is also uh, developing hypersonic capabilities. We're, we're looking at it purely from a, a, a conventional standpoint. There are other nations that look at it as a, a dual capability. Um, our Air Force is pursuing uh, uh, hypersonics, um, and uh, we will do that at the pace of relevance. Wonderful. And anything else you want to add, uh, General, before we close out? Um, this great conversation that we've had. You thanked the troops. I think that's incredibly important. Um, uh, reminding Americans that this mission continues to go on as Americans go about their day peacefully, but that it is something that um, underpins everything that our, our military does. Yeah, I guess I'd, I'll, I'll close where I started. Is uh, it's, it's something we don't talk about a lot. Uh, it's an assumed underpinning of our nation's defense. It is the bedrock of our nation's defense. Mm -hmm. Um, and as everyone goes home and sleeps well at night, uh, please know that you do that under the, the, uh, the guise of our airmen sitting alert out in the missile fields, uh, our airmen, maintainers, defenders, and support folks that uh, go around the globe with our bomber task force. Um, and uh, if you have an opportunity, I would ask you uh, to ask the tough questions about why we need this in our nation. Um, we don't talk about it enough, and I think it's an important discussion that we have to have. Couldn't agree more. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. Please um, join me in thanking General Boussier. Thank you.